Okay, well, uh, thanks so much for joining in. Um, my understanding is there's a bunch of classes from a bunch of different schools joining in, so that's super exciting. I can't even fit all of you guys on the screen. I literally have to scroll to be able to see everybody, so um, that's really cool. Um, thanks for joining. My name is Andrew. Um, I actually, oh, my name is Andrew Shu. His last name is spelled H-S-U, so it's spelled kind of unorthodox, which is why it was kind of hard to pronounce. Um, I always just tell people, like, when they ask me my name, I say, my name's Andrew. Last name is spelled H-S-U. I say that. If I say last name is Shu, they always start writing an S, and then I'm like, no, 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 it's H. It's confusing. Um, one time I remember I was in uh, in college, and the professor was, like, taking role. This was, like, in the early 1990s. And at that time, there was a famous actor by the name of Andrew Shu. His last name was spelled S-H-U-E. Um, and so the professor is taking role and they're like going down the list, like, is Andrew Shu here? And all the ladies in the class start looking around, like, where's this handsome actor, Andrew Shu? And I'm in the back, and I'm just like, no, it's just me. Sorry, I'm here. But um, anyway, so that's my, my name is Andrew. Um, and I uh, live in San Ramon, so pretty close to where you guys all live, I think. Um, my kids are actually in college now. One is third year at Arizona State University. And my daughter, uh, that was my son, and my daughter is uh, first year at Arizona State also. Um, they went to Doherty High School, so not too far. Um, but I'm super excited to be here today uh, to share with you some of my thoughts and a little bit of my experience of like um, being in digital media and what, what that's like. So let me just start off by sharing just a little sizzle reel. Um, this is just something you can find on my website. <clears throat> let me click share screen here here this is my you guys can see that right oops I think I need to click share sound optimize for video okay I can see your so, screen okay um, I just want to make sure the sound comes through too so actually this is kind of a hidden part of the website um, this, is, this is a sizzle reel that I have for employers uh, potential employers or like contractors um, to or contractees I guess to come and just look at sort of a little bit of my work and what it looks like. So this is what I share with people as a sizzle rule. So I'll just go ahead and share that with you guys right now. You guys can see, right? So that was uh, just a sizzle reel, and down below is like my resume and stuff like that. But um, that's something that I share with people in order to just, it's as a hook, right? To get them into, get them interested in uh, what I do, and what I'm doing, kind of a little bit of my style and what I'm capable of. So uh, let me just go into our talk today. Um, I'm gonna focus a little bit on uh, storytelling, uh, how to tell a story particularly with using emotional bonds, like using emotion. Um, so you guys can see the slides, yeah? Okay, great. Um, so just as a quick 
overview, we're going to do sort of introductions some the storytelling stuff and then how to connect with the audience and then we'll go into the Q&A. So the first part is um, the welcome, a little bit about me. So basically, I, I actually, uh, I was born in Taiwan and came to the States when I was maybe like two, two, two and a half or so, just a little kid. And um, so I more or less grew up here in the Bay Area, I moved around city to city in the Bay Area, but pretty much here in the Bay Area. Um, I ended up going to Chabot College, um, a community college in Hayward. Um, and then <clears throat> I actually dropped out of college um, halfway through uh, because I got an opportunity to work um, full time at uh, digital CD-ROM startup. And I was doing school and work at the same time and kind of full time both. And then I just decided to follow, you know, the paycheck, basically follow the money. And so I had to talk with my parents and luckily my parents aren't like super the typical Asian, you know, tiger parents. So they were kind of like not super enthusiastic about the idea of dropping out of school, but they were like, whatever you do, what you think is, is right. And, um, so I had to break the news to them. I was like, oh, I think I'm dropping out of college. So I started working at this place, um, the start, the startup, and we made a little screensavers. Now, nowadays it's screensavers aren't really necessary, but I think you guys still know what it is. It's basically a thing that a little animated, um, you know, a little animation that crosses your screen so that you don't get screen burn in on the old like plasma screens and LED screens back in the day. Um, oh, what's that? Okay. And then um, from there, I went to work at some video game companies. So I worked at EA Sports for a long time, um, doing art, um, interface design, 3D modeling, and things like that. And then um, in the late 90s, early 2000s, there was this what was called the dot com crash, <clears throat> where a lot of tech companies kind of went under. And there was this big recession in California, especially, but all throughout the, the nation. And as a result, I lost my job at um, gaming companies, I was kind of bouncing around to different smaller gaming companies, you know, as an art lead and things like that. And then eventually, I decided to start my own company. So I opened up my own company offering videography services. So primarily to start with, and you saw some of that in the um, in the uh, sizzle reel, primarily uh, working in the area of weddings as well as you know, some other things. So um, that happened for a while. And then shortly after that, I started offering photography, which is something that I've always loved. And you know, I took photo uh, photography in, in college and stuff like that. Um, but then I also started offering photography. So now my studio basically the business I run, it's called Studio MSV, and we offer photography and video services, so so digital media services. Um, personally, though, I also, you know, I took, I was an art major, so I can draw and, you know, do illustration, some graphic design, logo design, whatever, stuff like that. Some motion graphics. I'm not super strong in motion graphics, um, but I, you know, can do some. So that's a little bit about me. Um, and so currently in my work now, I have the benefit of, you know, maybe not so much right now during COVID because a lot of live events have been, you know, basically canceled um, in lieu of, um, you know, online meetings like this one. But in the past, I've been able to like travel places to shoot destination weddings, um, go across the country to shoot different conferences. And here you see like Brandon Yuri from uh, Panic at the Disco, Snoop Dogg, and the dude on the right is, um, if you guys watch Shark Tank, that's the guy, Robert Hershevik. And a lot of different, these model shoots and stuff that either I would set up for myself, um, just as a creative outlet and to practice and stuff like that. So I've had the chance to shoot and, and photograph a lot of different events, learn a lot of stuff at these different conferences and, um, you know, concerts and things like that. So it's been pretty, um, pretty cool. Like it's kind of a fun thing to talk about and to kind of feel proud of. Um, but at the same time, it's a ton of work, right? Like if you do a destination wedding, for example, some people will think, oh, that's super glamorous. They, they're flying they're, you know, the clients are paying you to fly to this tropical location and to, to photograph them or whatever, but it's a ton of work because typically, at least for myself, when I do destination weddings, I end up not, I try to cut the price down a little bit because, you know, the client then has additional cost of like travel and lodging and all that stuff on top of my fee. So I kind of bring my fee down a little bit so it's easier to swallow. And then on top of that, I, I end up not bringing help, right? I don't bring out a second shooter and stuff. So it's just by myself at a foreign place, kind of like nervous about whether or not people break into my hotel room and steal my gear. And so I'm keeping the gear on me, 
but then if I keep the gear on me, then at the same time, I'm like a target for, you know, robbers or whatever, depending on where you are, you don't always feel super safe. So you're schlepping all this gear around and you're just working double time. So it's, it is kind of glamorous to talk about, but it's a ton of work. And I think that's true for, for a lot of jobs, right? Like in the future, when you guys are working, you're saying, oh, I, I, I'm an animator or I, or I um, do these different things for these different great companies. It might sound really glamorous, but at the same time, it's going to be a lot of work. So just keep that in mind. Um, but so let's talk a little bit about storytelling. I think for you guys, you either have already learned a lot about like the three act structure and storytelling, um, or you have just in this innate storytelling sense. I think a lot of people in media, digital media, already are good storytellers and they, they have this built into them. Um, I think most people um, have this built into them just because of the way people have told stories all throughout history. This is kind of ingrained into humans, right? It's like you start off with an act. This is a straight screen grab from Wikipedia, as you can tell. But it's basically, you know, act one, you introduce the characters. Act two, there's some sort of a conflict or a confrontation. And then act three is the resolution. There's a big peak right before act three. And then there's a resolution. So that's typically the three act story structure. And I think when, when I do my wedding work or any corporate videos, um, I try to tell stories kind of in this way because that's just how we hear stories. You know, story of Little Red Riding Hood. It's like you get introduced to her and her grandma, whatever situation, and then she's on this quest and she has this confrontation with this wolf and stuff. And then the resolution being, or the climax being, she's eaten and stuff. And then the resolution being the the woodsman kills the wolf and frees them and stuff like that. So there's every single story, every good story that you hear follows this um, this structure. So let me share with you um, something that I did real brief, briefly uh, recently. Uh, this was a video that I, a little campaign video I did for um, Sabina. Uh, she is uh, the vice mayor of San Ramon and she was running for mayor just this last election cycle. And so she tapped me to, to come help her. Well, actually I offered, uh, because she's a friend of mine, I offered to, to make this video and she agreed. Um, so I went over her place and we sh filmed it maybe took including like setup and tear down of some lights and stuff like that maybe two hours just went over the stuff i took some of her um her old like family pictures like you know old pictures of hers and we crafted this story and it took about a day maybe two days to, to edit together so i really quick turnaround um but see if you can kind of follow this three act story structure in this video so let me just play this for you my name is Sabina and I would love to share a little bit about myself today. When I was 30, I moved here to San Ramon. I wanted to raise my kids in a safe community with great schools. I became very active in my kids' schools and our community. I became interested and involved in politics and public service when I got involved with Congressman Eric Swalwell's campaign. I got even more involved here when I served on the San Ramon Transportation Advisory Committee advocating to cut the commute times for San Ramon residents. Earlier this year, I was honored when the mayor and my colleagues on city council unanimously chose me to be the vice mayor. As your mayor, I will combine my community roots with my business technology background and the real experience that I have gained on council to lead our city through unprecedented times. My name is Sabina Zuffer, and I'm running for the mayor of San Ramon. Okay, cool. Um, let's cancel this. My name is Sabina Zafar, um, and I would. So yeah, so kind of follows this three act structure, right? And you want to be able to introduce the person, kind of get them connected to them. What is their endeavor? What's the mission? What's the like the main difficulty that they're trying to overcome? The conflict, and then a little bit of a res resolution. Obviously, for this, there's not that much of a resolution, except that she says, "I'm running for mayor." Um, and I guess leaves it in the hands of the voters uh, as to whether or not that will come to fruition. Um, so that is uh, a little bit of some recent work. I guess this is just from a few months ago. Um, so let me just move forward here. My name here. is Sabina Zumper, and I would love to... Let's get this out of here. Oops. Okay. So 
plot is not the same as story, right? A plot is how we get from point A to point B, but the story is the journey of getting from point A to point B. And you might wonder, like, if you're in digital media, that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, video work or filmmaking, right? Um, some of you might be aspiring filmmakers or screenwriters and stuff, and this is going to be important to you. But then if you're like a photographer like I am, or if you work in graphic, uh, graphics, graphic design and stuff, logo design, whatever, even motion graphics, like how, how do you make a story out of like a still image? Um, well, I would submit that um, that's still possible because you do leave a lot up to the imagination of the viewer, your audience, right? Um, but in order to make that connection so that they do take the time to look at the photo um, and emote with it and connect with it, you have to create an audience uh, connection. So one of the main, to me, one of the one of the key ingredients of being able to, to pull this off, create an audience connection, obviously if you do something in a color palette that they like, that's gonna connect them, or a subject matter that they like, that's gonna connect them. Um, and all of those things are great. Um, but I think if you don't have a emotional connection, all of those things are gonna kind of fall flat anyway. So here are some images that I uh, wanna share that they're just still images, but you can at least feel like some emotion there. And I think in doing so, you know, this person obviously is very joyful, very happy. And then you just can feel a little bit more connection with them. Um, this couple is obviously very in love, very happy. Um, and just viewing this picture, you know, you kind of feel happy or whatever. Um, this one, it's hard to pinpoint exactly what the emotion is, but there's something happening there that's like draws you in a little bit. And even in this one where you're not seeing anybody's face, this one communicates a gentleness or a caring or a love of some kind. This is actually a wedding photo um, for a wedding couple that I shot years and years ago. Um, now this one is interesting to me because this was a styled shoot. You know, I, I planned it and everything and I got this CD hotel room, um, but t from a technical point of view, I would say maybe this picture is not the best, just because the the um, the uh, composition is kind of off, right? Like everything's heavily weighted on the right side. It's kind of empty over here. So I would, if somebody was going to critique that, I would agree that this is technically maybe not the best photo. But there is a story here. Something is happening, and it's just interesting. Right. And so the way that she's looking at the camera, the cigarette, you know, subject matter on the TV. Now, that's just coincidental, like it could have been anything else. But um, it just looks interesting. And that kind of interest, that kind of like emotional connection creates this like story. Right. Like something's happening there. Something happened before that or is about to happen right after that. I'm not sure what, but there is some sort of an audience connection and there's some sort of story being told there. And so that's kind of what I um, encourage you guys to try to, to try to get to try to um, capture. Here's another one similar to the previous one. You know, like there's no emotional connection per se, but there's definitely some story happening here. And it's just mysterious and, and visually interesting. And it kind of draws you in a little bit too. The foreground, background uh, stuff happening. Um, so here, here's some, here's a comparison of like the same model. Um, some of them are even from the same shoot. Actually, maybe not, but the same model. And you can tell me like if you think that they're successful or not. So this photo is, you know, technically okay. You know, composition's good. Whatever subject matters right there, rule of thirds, all that stuff. It's great. Um, but there's just, I don't know, maybe it's the distance. Maybe it's her look. I don't know what, but there's like a little bit of a disconnect. It's just kind of, kind of static, very plain. This is my photo, right? So I'm critiquing my own photo. I'm not taking other people's work and, and bashing it. Um, I would say this photo, same model, actually this was the same shoot. Um, this one's more successful. You know, the composition is also very strong, but, but that backlighting creates something interesting, this halo effect, the way she's looking at the camera, whatever, this is a little bit more, more of an audience connection. So it's a little bit more, more powerful. And this one to me, and this is kind of subjective, right? Art is kind of like that. It's kind of up to you what you like. But this one to me is even more powerful. It's something else is happening here that's more powerful than this previous one and more so than the first one. So there's this audience connection that I'm trying to achieve or like 
it draws you into the photo and it tells a story. Here's another set. Um, so it's a lovely photo, you know, it's perfect for portrait or LinkedIn profile pic, whatever, nothing technically wrong with the photo. Um, this one's a little better, you know, maybe the hair and makeup does add to that, but the, the closeness of it, um, her, her look, the lack of a smile. I think sometimes when there's no, I direct my models a lot of times to not smile and to kind of part their lips, let their jaw fall sort of slack. Um, and that just has this great look, kind of this mysterious, um, alluring look. Um, and this one even more so. So up to you which one, like if this was a photo of yourself, maybe, I don't know, maybe this first one would be better for like professional use. Um, and these other ones maybe would be your personal favorites. But uh, so there's definitely a difference between this, these three looks and the audience connection that you make. Like that first one, it's great, it's fine, you know, but it's not, there's not much audience connection. Um, so this one, similar thing, like this is kind of a static product photo type thing, selling sunglasses or something. And then this one, same model, different look altogether. And this one, to me personally, like obviously different purposes, right? Like this, this first one is going to serve its purpose, but that second one is much more interesting to me. Like I'm much more drawn to that second photo than I am to the first one. And then what about inanimate objects? Uh, objects. So let's say this is um, the commission. I was photographing this uh, Louis XIV uh, cognac event, um, Louis XIII. And so, you know, I take this picture and it's fine. You know, they can publish it if they want or whatever. It's perfectly fine. But in terms of audience connection, I think this photo is just much more powerful, right? There's just there's joy there, there's levity, they're celebrating something and it's like associating the cognac with like good times or whatever. Um, so to me, that's, that's a much better product photo than the first one. And then just a couple more. Okay, so here's another inanimate object. I don't know if this is appropriate actually. Hide the screen, it's a gun. But um, so this actually tells a story, right? You look at this and there's not a single person in this photo, but it's like, there's something's happening here, something's happening behind the scenes and it's just compelling to me. Um, so audience connection through emotion is, is super, super important. Um, that's basically the gist of it, right? I think that was it. Uh, so thanks and then uh, Q&A time, I guess. I don't know if I'm super early on time or whatever, but plenty of time to Q&A uh, to look at other stuff if you guys want to. Yeah, we're, we're okay on time right now. I wanna okay. give everyone a second just, um, to kind of, you know, gather what you were sharing and sharing your own, right? Because these were all your photographs, all your right. work that you've done and how important it is that whether they're taking pictures or they're taking a video, it's important to tell a story and connect with their audiences, whoever they may be. Um, so anyhow, so I think that was really valuable. We do have one question so far. It was sent to me privately and to all the students in the chat box, if you would like to send me the question privately so not everyone sees it, that's okay. Um, but I see the first question is, where's the coolest location or shoot you've been to on? And I'm guessing that's referring to your wedding shoots that you were talking about. Sure. Um, there's been quite a few. I've been to, <clears throat> let's see, I went to Turks and Caicos once, that's in the Caribbean. Um, but actually, I think my favorite one was um, I shot in sort of the south, like south east of Lyon, France, in this little chateau, this like little castle, um, where a friend of mine who was also a video guy in the wedding industry, he was getting married. And so he had me come out and shoot. And so that one I did because he's a friend of mine, I did for free. And all I did was just have him pay for like travel and stuff like that. So I went out to France, shot this beautiful wedding there. This was for vo uh, video. And then had some days after that to go um, to Paris for the first time. And I didn't have my, my wife wasn't with me. Um, so all the romantic things like going up the Eiffel Tower or whatever, like I just didn't do it because I didn't want to do it without my wife there. But um, yeah, that, so that was a really fun, really great, memorable trip. But yeah, I've been to like Mexico several times, like Cancun and Puerto Vallarta, um, things like that. So, and then on the East Coast, I did one in uh, Maine, um, which was really cool. It's just like this right on the coast and stuff on this little sort of uh, 
I don't know, this nautical themed sort of wedding and stuff out there. So very cool. Like a lot of opportunities to travel a lot of places. So I'm, I count myself uh, very lucky in that, in that regard. Great. Thank you. Um, the next question, it's a, there's multiple questions in one, but it says, what was it like going from video games and corp and the corporate world to uh, photography and video and what's the difference? And then I'll ask the other ones after. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, video, the, so video game, the video game industry is not really the same as the corporate world in a lot of ways, like the video game industry and it, you know, it's def technically it's corporate cause especially cause it's uh, EA. Right. Um, and so there is definitely a corporate structure. You, know, you have to show up at a certain time, whatever, and, but it's, but it was pretty loose because it was, um, software, you know, it was like video games. And so it was very kind of relaxed and people had like toys, you know, all set up in their cubicles. And we took a lot of our breaks, just playing games with each other. Um, game testing or something like that is kind of different. Uh, that's a lot of people think game testing is like an awesome job, but it's, you literally just have to play a broken game over and over again and then document everything that's broken. So it's not as fun as it sounds. Um, but uh, game development is different in the sense that, uh, you know, you have this idea and, and a lot of things kind of, are open for suggestion, open for change. And so that, I actually really miss that, you know, that kind of creative environment and going into my own business, it's a whole different thing. Like, obviously I have a lot of control over my own schedule, the work that I take, um, how I decide to produce a particular piece. That's all entirely up to me because I'm my own art director, I'm my own, you know, creative director and my own boss. So I can do whatever I want. You know, in a lot of ways, that's really great for those of you that, um, are looking into freelancing or, or uh, doing commission work um, because you because people are commissioning you for your vision, right? Um, so in that sense, it's different because from the corporate side, from the video game side, you have to do what the the, the, the vision is. It's top down. Um, so it's pretty different. Um, I, I do kind of because I've been running my own business since two thousand and three, so it's been quite a long time now. Um, I kind of want. I kind of long for those times where like you can just clock out, you know, it's like 6.30, I'm done, I'm off work, don't talk to me, I'm gonna go home, play video games, hang out with my family, and that's just be done with it. Um, but I can't really do that um, as a business owner because you have to be on the clock all the time. So that's one downside. Okay, so the next part of that question is, what's your day-to-day -day life like now? And which one did you like more? I think you touched on that a little bit, but if you yeah. wanna just share. Yeah, totally. So I did touch on that a little bit and that's kind of how it was. And, and now, you know, I do kind of get caught up in like the stressful part of it and tell people, you know, warn people about it, um, about owning your own business that is. But you know, it's, it is nice. Like I can do this right now. It's in the middle of the day, it's like 1.30, right? And I can volunteer for junior achievement or I can, you know, go play video games. Like I've been playing a lot of Warzone lately. Um, so you, it's, it's nice. Um, but you still have to, especially right now when there's not a lot of work going on, it's kind of stressful because you don't have like this regular paycheck. You have to work and go out and get a contract, you know, get someone to hire you to do something and then you get paid. Otherwise you, you don't get a paycheck. So there's pluses and minuses. Great. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, do you work until your clients are satisfied with your images? That's a great question. Um, for because of that question is why I actually really enjoy doing wedding work and personal sort of uh, like portraiture work or like family portraits and stuff like that, because they don't really kick it back and say, change this and change that. Now, if I'm doing a corporate job and they have a particular look they're going for or, or something very specific that they want, they will kick it back and say, can you change this, change that? And it gets, sometimes it gets super tedious. Uh, for that reason, in my contract, I give them one, and this is, you know, if they, if they don't like this, it's flexible, but typically my contract is, um, they get one, uh, they get one review slash change and then one more, uh, what I, uh, what do I call it? Um, approved with changes. So basically they get one round of changes and then they get one more set of changes that's approved with changes. In other words, if they say, can you make this more blue, then they don't get to kick it back again. I say, okay, I'll make it more blue and that's it. It's done. So they basically kind of get like one and a half rounds of changes because I had it before where they just keep going back and forth about every little thing. And then they end up changing it back to the way you had it like three versions ago. And you're like, dude, I had this like three versions ago. And um, 
so yeah, so it, when it's a personal sort of commission, it's much more up to you, up to me. Um, but when it's a corporate job, unless they're just super cool about it, they tend to have a lot of things to say. Thank you. Um, the next question is, how did you figure out your style of photography? Ooh, um, I don't even know how to categorize my style. You know, like people will say like, during like phone interviews or Zoom interviews, they're like, oh, how, how would you categorize your style? And I don't even know how to verbalize that. I think it's important to have some words, obviously, to say, but it's hard to kind of like literally, um, you know, categorically put yourself into like a, a pigeonhole. Um, I found my style, I think, just by looking at other images, like what resonates with me. And then in some ways, you know, not copying, but like emulating a particular look. Like you saw a certain amount of like sort of retro looking filmic sort of grainy stuff, maybe black and white stuff. Um, that one image where there's the, the CD hotel and the smoking, you know, model with the TV, like stuff. I love stuff like that just because it's so interesting and gritty and it kind of has this retro vibe. Um, and I think I de developed that style just because I like it, you know, um, and if you go after those things that you like, you'll just be able to hone it and refine it. Uh, I actually found that a lot of my earlier shoots that I did where I was not as technically good in terms of like camera work, exposure, all that stuff, those actually turned out better in some ways because I was more focused on like creating this emotion than worried about exposure and composition and, you know, will this sell and what, you know, sort of aspect ratio should I shoot this at and am I going to crop it in post whatever I was just after getting a, an emotion um, and I think you know you have to balance it but I, I do feel like chasing that emotion capturing something that you really like to look at yourself um, is a great way to define and refine uh, your own style great thanks uh, the next one is what is the biggest difference between video and photo capture um Two things I would say, mm, two big things and one small thing. So the two big things are sound, right? When you're doing video, you have to be concerned with audio and that's a big hassle, um, especially shooting a live event and you gotta make sure you capture, you know, people speaking into mics or people talking, whatever. Sound capture is super important because if you, you can have great video, but it's crappy sound. Like my sound right now is kind of crappy. Like you hear this buzz. I gotta figure out what's happening here with my mic, but um, sound capture is super important. If you have great video and bad audio, it's unwatchable, right? Um, but if you have like kind of bad focus or the colors off, but the, the audio is clear and it's crisp, people can understand what people are saying, that's still watchable. Like people will still sit through something like that. Um, so I think that's a huge one because in photography, you don't have to worry about sound at all. Um, another one is motion. Uh, with photography, you have to capture motion in the frame. Like either you mess with your shutter speed so that you can capture some motion blur or you just have to be aware of it, right? Like how are you going to capture this motion and, and kind of replicate it in a still image? Whereas in video, you literally just capture the motion. Um, but, you know, you have to understand motion when like something's passing through the frame is different than if you're tracking it as it's moving. You know, those are different, um, different dialects of the same language, I guess. So I have to think in those terms. And then the other small thing that I wanted to mention is... Uh, your aspect ratio, right? Nowadays with cell phones, a lot of people do film, you know, horizontally or vertically, but typically when you're doing motion pictures or, you know, making a short film, whatever, you're all gonna be sh filming in this aspect ratio. Um, in photography, you don't have to. If you got a model and this like redwood tree, you can f shoot it this way to kind of capture that height. Um, in a video, you're kind of limited in how you're gonna capture that height. But those are the main differences. I think audio is a big part of it. Do you uh, prefer color photos or black and white photos? Ooh. Um, now, when I get asked questions like this, I like to pretend like never again see a black and white photo or never again see a color photo. Um, and that, and it, which one would I be more okay with? Um, I think black and white photos are more dramatic and in emoting, I think there's a little bit more something about black and white that speaks to me. But if I was never to see another black and white photo, I would probably be more okay with that than 
never seeing a color photo again. But that's my weird way of answering those types of questions. That's okay. Uh, going back to when you were sharing your story, um, somebody's asking what games did you work on and how long does it take to become proficient enough at drawing to be a good concept artist? Um, great questions. Um, so I worked on a bunch of games way back PlayStation 1. So a lot of you guys probably weren't even born yet. <laughs> PlayStation 1, you know, the little, the little gray one. Uh, I worked on a NCAA basketball title called March Madness. So, um, you know, like college basketball game. I worked on Knockout Kings, which was the boxing title. Um, it featured like Muhammad Ali on the cover. I don't know if you might, might have seen it. It's like an old classic EA Sports title. Um, those are the main two. I did a little bit of work on Tiger Woods Golf, um, not a lot. And then because they, they kind of farm out artists, like help different studios when they're falling behind, they need assets to, to, to catch up and stuff like that. Um, those are the three main titles that I worked on. Um, March Man has a couple of different years, right? And then um, same thing with the Knockout Kings. I think I did two different years. But uh, those are basically the ones, and you probably haven't heard of any of them. And then how long does it take to become proficient enough to be a good concept artist? Now, I think the tricky part there is a good concept artist, right? Like, what is good? I see a lot of great concept artists, like on my Instagram feed that I follow, and I can't imagine getting to that point. Like, in my life at this stage, like, being able to, like, practice to get good enough to do what they do is going to be a tall order. Um, for you guys, I think it's you're much closer because you're teachable and you can learn and you can have time to practice those things. Um, but I, you know, years, I don't know. It depends on how good is good. And I, I've seen some concept artists that aren't very good that I'm like, eh, like maybe they're better than me, but not by a lot. And I don't, you know, like, so you might get hired, uh, you know, a person could still get hired if they have like kind of a good vision, but maybe their, you know, their arts illustrations aren't that great. I don't know. Hard to say, but I would definitely say if that's something you want to do, just start practicing now and, and keep at it for sure. Do you ever regret not finishing college, although you've um, become a very successful photographer and videographer? Mm, thanks for that. <laughs> Sometimes I don't feel super successful, especially nowadays. I'm like not getting hired to do any gigs because there are no gigs out there. Um, but do I ever regret? I, every once in a while, I think, you know, I wonder like what would it have been like if I had gotten a degree or whatever, like would I be more successful or, or do better? Or I kind of feel like if I could go back and get a degree or had gotten a degree, it would probably would have been in business or marketing, to be honest. Um, so these skills that I have are um, what's called autodidactic. Autodidactic just means self-taught. Um, I learned that word one time when someone was like, are you an autodidact? I'm like, what <laughs> but um yeah so a lot of the skills that you guys have if you're honest you're like they're self-taught right a lot it just comes from practice or it's just innate talent you guys just have a good sense of color or composition and can illustrate or whatever um so a lot of those things you can just hone but if i were this is kind of off the topic i apologize it's, i'm not really directly answering the question now but but if i were to go back and study something in college it probably would be marketing or business I think that's super valuable. Um, even if you're just going to be hired by somebody, I think it's really important to, to have that skill set. Um, but do I agree, uh, regret it? Uh, a little bit. I don't know if regret's kind of a strong word. Maybe I just look back sometimes. Bittersweet, maybe. What is something a high school photography student can start working on now if this is a field mm -hmm. they want to go into? Yeah, that's awesome. Um, definitely start working on emotional storytelling. Now, the composition stuff, you know, working your camera, aperture, ISO, all that stuff, even like film, if you guys get to work with film, you know, the film development and dodging and burning, all that stuff and playing with negatives, like those are all awesome things that you should know and definitely will get better at. But like learning how to capture emotion and be able to tell a story through like an emotional connection, I think is so critical um, because I do video uh, and I did a lot of like wedding videography. I got to work with a lot of wedding photographers, right? So the video guy and the photographer, maybe two different teams, whatever. And I get to see a lot of like photographers doing their thing. And I've seen a lot of bad photographers just not work well with um, the bride and groom. And 
I actually was mentored by this other photographer that I know. Um, and she's incredible. And, and I just learned so much about like putting yourself out there. Like when you're, okay, so here, here's a quick side lesson. I don't want to take too long. Um, how are we doing on time? We're okay, right? Um, I don't want to take too long, but I think this is the valuable thing, especially for you photographers out there. Um, they, they, they say like, learn how to pose your subject, right? Like, oh, your hand like this looks weird or like your chin go like this makes you look thinner or whatever. But I don't like to use the word pose because what is a poser but somebody who's phony, right? So that's just what a poser is, is somebody who's phony. So I like to say directing. Like I, I, I wanna direct my clients or I don't wanna direct the subject, the model, the bride or whatever. I wanna direct them in a way that they can feel something or they're emoting a, a something and I can capture it. Um, so a lot of that actually has to do with you putting yourself out there and doing the thing that you want them to, to emulate. So if you want them to like, just they, you know lean into them, just be really in love and just lean in and smile. You gotta do it for them so they can see what it looks like. Not only that, but they only give you like one tenth of what you show them. So if you go do this, they'll go like this, like that. And you're like, no, 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 like this. And they'll go like this. And it's just, it's terrible, right? So if in order to get them to do this, you have to do it's like you have to really get into it so it's it's embarrassing and you got to really put yourself out there even right now it's like it's embarrassing that i'm doing this but like you really have to like 10x right what you want them to do and you just put yourself out there and it's ridiculous but you do it and then they kind of copy your 10x thing and they get a tenth of it right and then that's it that's the look i want and then you can capture it so a lot of that like getting them to laugh or getting them to like look really in love and looking into people's eyes and you got to learn you know like the jaws and what should it do, the lips and, you know, a little fire in the eyes. I, I call it tiger, um, uh, fire eyes. So I always tell them like, give me like some intensity in the eyes, just give me some fire. So that makes like a lot of those pictures that you saw, you know, the, the model, you know, does that and it just looks so much better for whatever reason. So what are, to answer the question, what are some things that, you know, you should learn these types of things, like emoting and how to capture like any emotion from like, physicality right um and that you know either takes practice or you look you can look at other successful photographers and what are the models doing try to try to copy that try to learn it was it difficult for you to find work after dropping out of college yeah so i dropped out of college because i already had a job right that's the reason why i dropped out of college um so no it wasn't super difficult but it was kind of you know, like we talked about already, maybe it was a decision that I made, you know, I won't hype it up too much, but um, yeah, I, I think for you guys in this time, it'll be kind of, I don't want to discourage you or, or scare you or anything, like that, but it'll be challenging. I think my kids are in college right now, so they're about to get out of college and start looking for work. And it's tough because everyone's working from home right now you know they don't have like internships really going on like my son's looking for internships he's in like studying finance and stuff and nobody's offering any internships because literally no offices are open so you can't really mentor anybody or have people shadow you or do stuff like that because everyone's working from home so it's it's kind of challenging right now i know you guys are just about to get into college so maybe it'll be different in a few years from now but um definitely it, the landscape is kind of shifting it's kind of different so who knows? Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, the next question is, do you pay the models that you shoot? Also, you have a really cool job. So what do you do to relax when you want to get away from your job? Cool. Good questions. Um, so the models, depending on the shoot, most of the time they're called, uh, they're called test shoots. Like I'll reach out to a model, um, either through an agency, which is like sort of the best way to do it. I do have a friend who owns an agency, so I have a lot of access to different models from, from his agency. But um, you reach out to the model through the agency um, or directly to them. Sometimes you can just reach through um, Instagram, you know, like you see a professional model, not just like some rando, like, you know, um, influencer or whatever, but like a legit model. And then you can reach out to them. And if you're a photographer and you, they go to your page and they see that you're a legitimate photographer, then you can just... Um, set up a test shoot and a test shoot is basically a free shoot for you and for uh the model 
and he gets to use the images for free and you get to use it um, to for free as well and it's a way for him or her to practice and for you to practice and you both are just kind of trading this this time um, and in those situations these test shoots uh, sometimes it's called tfp which means trade for prints or trade for photos um, in those situations no money really exchanges hands in other situations where it's a professional shoot like in that sizzle reel some of them were like paid shoots then they would get paid um, i'm usually not the one paying them it's usually like somebody who put that shoot together um, but yeah and then what do i do to relax them? right now i just play warzone i do that all the time all day um, but yeah video games a lot and i try to like uh, I actually am super interested in philosophy, so I'm learning a lot about epistemology, which is the study of how we know things. Um, so philosophy is is my hobby as well. Great, thanks for sharing that. Um, the next question is, what kind of camera do you mainly use, and what's your favorite camera that you have used? Okay, so I'm not a a crazy gearhead uh, surprisingly a lot of video guys and photo guys are just super into the latest model and stuff um, right now I'm using Canon 5d the 5d line um, I'm using a 5d 3 which is almost like two generations out of date already um, and now Canon's all moving to uh, mirrorless which is like the, so Sony cameras they don't have like a like a mirror um, it's more like your phone camera, which just flashes directly onto the sensor. Um, so my cameras aren't super up to date um, in terms of what's my favorite. It would be either my current 5D Mark III or I have this old Canon um, film camera that I took on this Hawaii trip with me. And that was kind of fun to use, but you know, whatever, it's not something I would do for like professionally all the time or whatever. Um, and it was another was there another part of that question no it was just those two it was um what cameras do you use and then what was your favorite yeah. and, I, um, and i will say this one 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 more thing people often will see me working at a wedding or working at some event they'll come up and they're like oh what's the best camera out there and there's a saying that photographers in general like this is not my saying but the best camera is the one you have on you i don't know if you guys have heard that saying before but the saying is you know, the best camera is the one that you have on you because things happen all around you all the time. And you guys know this because you guys have your cell phones with you all the time. And you can just either snap a picture or, or you know, Snapchat or take a picture or Instagram or whatever um, to your Finsta that your parents don't follow or whatever. And then you just take pictures. You take pictures all the time. And it's not really what camera is the best, it's whether or not you're able to get the photo. So that's kind of the meaning of that, that sentence. Um, so just keep that in mind. Oh, since COVID, um, this is the next question, and the loss of gigs, how have you been able to handle that to keep your business open? Um, well, luckily for me, uh, we're dual incomes. So my wife also works, so we're able to kind of just support each other. Some years I make way more money than she did. She owns her own business as well, so we're both business owners. Um, in other years, she makes way more money than I do, but it's all fine because it goes in the same account, and we're a couple, and we love each other, and it doesn't matter. But um, but yeah, right now it's, it's it is kind of tough because there aren't a lot of live events for me to, to photograph. But I have done um, some editing jobs here and there, um, and a lot of it comes from word of mouth, to be honest. So I, you got when you're out there in the workplace, like you just gotta be a cool person. Like even if your work, you know, there's people out there that does better work than you. That's always gonna be the case, right? Um, but if you're just like really cool and just nice to be around you're good to work with and people like you then they'll want to work with you you know to be honest like they would rather work with you like if let's say i was like an eight out of ten you know my work and then there's another guy that's 10 out of 10 but i'm just like funny and easy to get along with and just nice and you know respond well to emails and just polite or whatever and the other person's just kind of a prima donna kind of conceited or whatever like they would rather work with me, right? Even if it's they're getting eight out of 10 work and that guy could give them 10 out of 10, it's just not worth a headache. And so when you're a good person to work with, you sometimes do get these random referrals like I have been lately, just out of the blue. Like I got this call from 
Ohio of all places, this random um, B2B business. B2B means business to business. So it's a business that creates a service for other businesses to use. So it's a B2B business, they, they're in software and they basically um, help people, help contractors like construction contractors find work. So it's a software platform that helps people to post jobs and find work, whatever. So they're a company that does that. Now I've never heard of them or have any had anything to do with them, but they contacted me to help them edit like a Christmas little holiday season video for them um, during Christmas time because they got my name from this other person that I worked with who got my who I've worked with in the past and they got my name from somebody else, you know. Um so if you're just cool to work with and you do pretty good work, people will reach out to you. Uh, at least that's the hope. And so lately for me to answer your question, that there has been some of that, you know, like some editing jobs here and there that just came out of the blue. But, you know, I'm kind of beating the pavement, just trying to call up old contacts. Hey, you guys got anything going on, you know, let me help you with this, whatever. So trying trying to be like humble and go out there and, and reach people great thank you uh the next question is what are some applications that you like to um do for or use for your edits um so i am on pc so i'm on the, the adobe suite so i use premiere uh, after effects for my motion graphics stuff, photoshop all the time lightroom is what i use for photo editing and stuff like that processing um yeah great so um for drawing and illustration i want to also add on my ipad i use this program called procreate which you know you can use the apple pencil and stuff um super cool program and really good for for illustrators and stuff awesome thank you somebody else mentioned procreate also so that's good to know um the next question is going back to the video game industry um what qualifications did you have to uh have to get into that um is it listed here i'm trying to see it okay it's probably no it was sent to me yeah okay um yeah so uh, now this is going to sound kind of counterintuitive because y you guys have seen the meme right you need job experience to get a job well how do i get a job go get, how do i get experience go get a job it's, you know it's that same dilemma um I actually got my very, very first sort of media job because of a referral from a friend who knows that I'm a good illustrator. And she was asked to do this thing and she just wasn't into it. And so she, she was gonna quit that job and then she referred me and then she quit and then I took over that position. So that was kind of like, you know, who you know. Um, and I think a lot of this in any industry is gonna be a little bit of that. Like, I don't want it to, say, oh, you don't need to study, you don't need to get good at your craft, just know, you know, just have connections. I don't want to say that, but that is a part of it. So um, to add to my previous answer about what can people start learning now, that question was about photography, but just in general, like what can you guys start working on now? I definitely would suggest um, working on networking. It's kind of a weird thing because it's not, it feels kind of like a cop out and it feels kind of like a cheap way of, of getting a gig. But definitely start getting to know people. Um, you know, your parents have friends who own businesses and put it out there that you can do a logo for them or put it out there that you can do their headshots for free that they can put on their website because the ones they have are selfies from their phones or whatever and just say, I'll, I'll take some headshots for you. And then obviously don't work for free forever, but like just to start building connections, it's, it's worthwhile. Um, I think that's super valuable. Um, I've had like I already illustrated, I have had tons of jobs that just came from referrals for that reason. I kind of forgot what the question was. I hope I addressed it. <laughs> That's okay. You did. We have about uh, a little bit less Couple than more. 10 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Um, go, and we have about three more questions. Okay. Um, so this one was sent to me privately, but it says, what are the chances of inventing a new style in photography to become successful in the field? And then isn't the field already saturated with good photographers and videographers? Yeah. Um, so I don't know if you guys have heard this saying before, but as a, a fine art student in college, I heard this and it really resonated with me. They basically, the saying, I don't know if it comes from like, I wanna say it comes from Picasso or something, but the saying is, 
um, good artists copy and great artists steal. So <laughs> what they mean is like, you can copy a style and be like, oh, look, I can do this anime style, or oh, look, my drawings look like this style, or my pictures look like this style. And it's like, okay, cool, you're, you're pretty good, I guess. And you kind of can achieve like a good level. But the great artists steal. In other words, they take it and then make it their own. They're not saying, oh, this looks like this manga style, or look at my pictures, it looks like Annie Leibovitz or whatever. They literally take, they see stuff, they're inspired, and then they make it their own. And so it's, you can't really look at that and say, oh, look, he's copying his style. It's like his own thing. Um, and I'm saying that because inventing a new photo style, I mean, I, I see no logical reason why that can't happen. I think that's challenging just because it has been, you know, hundreds of years since photography was invented. And there are, it is very saturated. There are a lot of good photographers out there. But that's not to say you can't put a new twist on your thing, you know, like, thematically sub subject matter wise you guys can focus on you know things that nobody else was able to focus on before maybe like social justice issues or you know a new wave of like social media the way how how do you capture the new way of interacting with people which is through zoom right through this as opposed to face to face like this is a brand new phenomenon for us and there's always going to be some new stuff in the world that you can try to capture in on, on camera. Um, so in that sense, I think they're, you know, it's wide open. You can always do something interesting and new. Now, if it's brand, brand new, like, I don't know, if you're a technologist, you get into like AI or robotics or whatever, and then you can create photos that never existed. Or have you guys seen that thing where they use AI to create human faces? like photos of people that don't exist, but they look like actual photos. And they've just taken a amalgam of like 10,000 different photos on Google or whatever. And they're able to like make it into a portrait. And this is a portrait that looks like a human. It just looks like a real portrait of a real human, but it's not someone that ever existed. It's purely digital. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of new interesting things out there. And then what was the second part of that question? I'll try to go faster, I know. That's okay. I'm going back to it. Um, there was other things coming into the chat box. So the second part of the question is, isn't the field already saturated with good photographers, videographers? Yeah. It, it is saturated, but if, if person A has a need and there's all these celebrity photographers, these great photographers out there, and they don't, they can't contact them, but they can contact you, th then you're their photographer now, right? So yeah, there are other photographers out there, but if you're the one that they hire, you're the one that fills that need for them at this time, at this place, then it doesn't matter. Great. Um, so this one's a, a question from a teacher. It says, asking for my students who are stressed about having to decide on a career. When you were in high school, did you know what you wanted to study or eventually do with your career? What would you say to a high school junior or senior who is stressed about picking a major or picking a career? Awesome, awesome question. I actually was doing a junior achievement talk uh, yesterday or the day before yesterday with um, day before yesterday with uh, um, junior hires, eighth graders. And this question kind of came up in a sense. And I would just say, okay, when I was in high school, I thought I was going to become an architect. Uh, like, you know, because I was super good at drawing, whatever. And I, that's the path I thought I was going to take. Um, and everything kind of changed, right? Pretty different. Um, so I would say like not to worry too much about the specific thing. Obviously, you're always going to have people say, just do the thing that you love. And if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life, which I think is baloney because it's hard work. It's always going to be hard work if you want to be successful. Um, but I will say this. If you find a job that is focused on helping people, you will never be out of work, right? If There's always going to be people that need help out there in the world. And if you're able to fill a need then you'll just always have work right it could be anything um and obviously if we want to do something that's related to like digital media and you know visual arts is stuff that we're passionate about but you know it's a path right you're not going to go from point a directly to point b necessarily you, you're going to journey around and find different branches and do different things things that fulfill you in ways that you didn't know um could i will say one last thing on this on this point um I find that it's more important to like the people you work with than to like the job that you're doing. Now, 
I, I, I knew this way back when I, even when I was like in high school, I thought about the hypothetical. Like if I got my dream job of an, being an architect or actually I really wanted to be like a forest ranger, just live out in nature and just whatever, um, or like a Formula One car, a race car driver. Like if I got my dream job, but everyone around me, they were all jerks. They're always sabotaging my reports or trying to like get me fired or whatever. Meanwhile, there's this other alternative uh, where I can maybe have a crappy job. You know, maybe I'm just picking up people's poop or something all day long. Just something super disgusting. But my coworkers are super cool and they make me laugh and we go out for beers after or we just like hang out and we, we play games together and they're just super cool people and I can be open with them. Like I would rather have that second situation, right? Like wouldn't you? Like that's so much better. That's such, such a better like living life experience. So I, I just want to throw that out there. Great. So time-wise, we only have time for this last question. Okay. Um, and then if anybody else has a question and wants to stay on a little longer, Andrew, if you're okay with staying a couple I'm minutes. Cool staying. Yeah. Um, and then, so this last question says, did becoming a photographer as a job make it less fun as a hobby? Very good question. Very insightful. I think it did a little bit. Um, that's why I do the, the test shoots because the test shoots are my way of like taking control of my own photography and doing the thing that I want to do, um, you know, create a vision and then like go after it and try to achieve that vision. Uh, what, you know, the other type of photography jobs that I get are, you know, wedding photography and corporate event photography. Sometimes I'll do um, family portraits and stuff like that. Like holiday season during the fall, you get the little family portraits they put on their holiday cards. Um, and those are all great but it's what they want, right? It's what the corporate wants. It's what that family wants. It's what somebody else wants. But in order to do the thing that I want, I do those uh, shoots on the side. Great, thanks. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording now.